So our next speaker is Matei Zaharia. He was on the stage yesterday and is the lead student for the Spark Project and lead developer and leader of the community. Um, <laughs> so he'll be talking about advanced Spark features right now, which include the cache partitioning function, serialization, and storage format, caching formats. Okay, <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so unfortunately, Spark doesn't yet support crowdsourcing. Maybe in the future it will, but uh, I'm going to talk about other stuff um, that we do have. Um, yeah. Um, so basically, in yesterday you've seen already the, the core of Spark, which is uh, these uh, distributed data sets called RDDs, and then transformations and actions, which are different um, operations you can perform on them in parallel. Now, as we went out, you know, we designed this and then we said, okay, we think this looks good. And we started working with people to build applications. We found that, you know, there are lots of interesting applications out there and there are many other um, kinds of things you can implement to improve the performance. And in fact, we're very happy about this because uh, we've been trying to use Spark as a research platform to figure out what is needed next in cluster computing. Um, and we've, I think we, we've managed to do well at that. We've added a bunch of uh, fairly interesting things um, since we started the project and we've still kept the project small and extensible. So I'm going to show three features today that we have uh, that you may want to use and these all work seamlessly with the model you've seen so far. So let's go back to, to what we had um, in the Spark model. If you remember from yesterday, the core idea was that you want to process distributed collections with these functional operators that work the same way they do on local collections. And so at, at the bottom there, I just have a code example. This is something you might write as you attempt to implement k-means, for example. So you have points, which is an RDD of data points, so that's a distributed collection. You have some cluster centers, uh, which are just a variable with the current centers in your k-means, and then maybe you want to map each point uh, to the cluster center, um, you know, which, which cluster it's part of. Um, so there's like two, two things going on here. So first there's the collections uh, themselves, and then there's this, this uh, way of operating on them with functions. Um, and these are the places we've looked at to, to extend the model. So first um, is, you know, when you program with collections on a local machine, you care a lot about data structures and layout of the data. And we want to let you do the same on a cluster. And we provide some, some features that let you do that and can actually dramatically improve uh, performance. Um, second, we wanted to look at the interaction between um, the, these functions and the program. So basically there's two things we'll look at. One is, okay, we have this distributed collection. How should we lay it out across the nodes? And this is you know, one of the things we're doing. We're actually working on more stuff here as well. Um, and then the other one is uh, we have this variable in here. How should we control how this variable is shipped to other machines in the cluster? So I'm going to talk about three features. Um, broadcast variables and accumulators extend this idea of variables that are shared between your program and the, the functions running on the cluster. And then controllable partitioning lets you control the data layout of RDDs. Um, and these are all features that are already in Spark. Actually, they've, they've been there for uh, at least a year now, I think, um, all of them. Um, and then I'll end with a little bit on extending Spark if, if that's something you want to do, especially if, if you're a researcher. Uh, I think it's actually a pretty s small platform and one you can use to, to implement interesting stuff. So let's start with broadcast variables. Um, so the, this is one of the things that started like immediately out of us handing this over to, to folks implementing machine learning at the lab. Um, so what's, what's kind of the problem that we're solving here? Um, so normally when you have a, a closure in Spark that you're shipping to the cluster, like the map I showed before, um, where you use variables inside it, we want to ship them to the cluster with the closure. And that's kind of essential uh, so that you can have you know, stuff from the rest of your program affect what's going on on the cluster. But in some cases, uh, these variables are very large. So for example, with k means, well, if your k was very high, you would have a ton of cluster centers. Uh, that's not a fantastic example because you don't do that, but um, in other algorithms, you have a parameter vector, which is you know, n-dimensional, where you have n features in your machine learning algorithm, and n can be easily like 100,000 or a million. 
Um, and so if these variables are shared across tasks or across operations, um, we want to do something more efficient than just sending a new copy of it with each task. Um, so just as two examples, I, I talked about having a large lookup table or a large parameter. The other um, common thing you can do with this is what's called a map side join, which is a, an optimized way to do a join um, in some cases in a MapReduce-like system. So let's look at, um, at map side join. Uh, by the way, if, if you have questions about any of this at any point, uh, do let me know. Um, yeah. so, so here's kind of the, the join example we saw last time. Um, here we have two RDDs of key value pairs. We have page names. These are, uh, say, the, the names of web pages on our site. Um, and, uh, you know, we have it in a file pages.txt. They map each URL to a name. And then we have a click log with visits. And this has a URL and a visitor, like an IP address that visited it. And we want to do a join so that we get the page name along with each visit. So if you just do the join this way, this is what's going to happen on the cluster. Um, so we're going to, to have these two data sets, pages.txt and visits.txt, and we're going to partition them um, and run some map tasks on them. And then the way join is implemented um, is that you hash together um, pages and visits for the same URL to the same machine. So here I'm showing, so in the reduce test here, we have, say, URLs beginning with letters A through E might hash to this machine, F through J might go to this one uh, below, and so on. So, so that's what happens. Um, so the, the problem with, uh, with this is that um, basically you, you send the whole data set over the network because most pages and most visits will not start out on, on the machine that actually has that hash code. So basically everything has to be sent over the network. Um, and so, so that's pretty expensive. So what can you do better here? One of the things you can notice here is the pages data set is much smaller than visits. And it kind of makes sense because you have a finite you know, number of pages on your website. Um, so there's another way of doing the join that saves network communication. And if you remember from Jan's talk yesterday, network communication is at first glance the most expensive thing you're doing on the cluster. So that's the thing you want to minimize first. Okay. So what can you do if one table is small? Um, the f first thing you could try is, let me just collect the, the table as a local variable. Um, and now I have you know, this array of pages in memory. Um, and let me do a map function. And what that will do is basically pages.txt will go over to the master. And then it will be shipped with the map closure to every uh, task that processes the visits.txt. And you know, imagine pages.txt is like a megabyte and visits.txt is, is you know, uh, whatever, uh, 100 gigabytes or something like that. This is much better than sending, the whole, sending both of them over the network, even though you're sending one copy uh, you, you know, of pages.txt with every task. And what you do in, you know, in, the, in the map function is you just use this, this pages.txt as a hash table. Here, to map turns it into a hash table. And you can look up in the hash table and do your join that way. Um, so, this, so this is good. Um, the only problem, though, is it's still less efficient than it needs to be. Because uh, one machine in the cluster might run many map tasks. And we're sending this variable with every task. So what, what can we do uh, better than that? Um, we, we have, um, um, yeah, sorry. And, and this basically, uh, so as I already mentioned, but th this runs locally on each machine. You don't need to ship the visits. Okay, but the problem is each, um, yeah, each, each task sends a new copy of, um, of pages. So what you can do better um, is you can use a broadcast variable. And really the idea of a broadcast variable is just that it's a, a variable you want to use in your tasks that's read only and that will be sent to each machine only once. Uh, once you send it to a machine, it will stay cached on that machine in memory and um, you don't have to send a new copy. So this is how you use it. It's, it's really simple. Um, at the top, you make the, you, you do spark context that broadcast, and you give it the variable you want to broadcast. And this gives you back an object that's a little wrapper, um, it, whose type is broadcast of map of whatever is in the map. Um, and then on your actual tasks, you have to use broadcast variable dot value to access the value. And the first time you call value on each machine, it will fetch it over there. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is there. It's similar in Hadoop. There's a similar concept called distributed cache, which lets you send a table to have with each task. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. Uh, so say you have real time, real time data, 
Oh, if you have three or 400 megabytes of data, does it fit in? Yeah, it would. We, we've done this with sort of gigabytes of, of data for these, uh, these tables. So uh, I'll talk about that next, like how we actually optimize this. Yeah. Okay, so that's, I mean, that's all it is. It's, it's a very simple syntax, but it's kind of a cool thing because it looks to you, you know, it looks to you like you're just using this variable in your program, but by wrapping it this way, we controlled how it gets shipped. So, you know, this, the serialized version of this task is basically like a pointer to this thing, and each machine only fetches it once. Um, so, yeah, and you use dot value. Okay. Um, so just to, to summarize the rules, you create this with spark context.broadcast. You access it with dot value. Only one task grabs it on each node. And of course, you shouldn't modify the value after creating it. So right now, there's no way for us to stop you from doing that, but the updates are not gonna propagate to the other nodes. So don't do that. Um, now, one of the fun things with this was um, it actually led to, to a, a good research problem. So we, we implemented this first, and we copied what Hadoop did with, uh, with the distributed cache, which is you just write the thing you want to share to the Hadoop file system, and then each node reads it only once. And we ran some applications. This is actually a collaborative filtering application developed in the lab. But what we saw is with, with this technique of using HDFS for broadcast, the communication cost of the broadcast quickly um, grows as the number of machines increases. And this application stopped scaling at 60 nodes because it just got more expensive to broadcast the more nodes, even though the computation itself parallelized pretty well. Um, so we, we designed a peer-to-peer -peer algorithm for broadcast in data centers that's based on BitTorrent. It's called Cornet. And this is included in Spark. And by, by basing it on basically an optimized BitTorrent for the data center environment, we were able to keep the time nearly constant with the number of machines. And so there's a paper you can read about this at SIGCOM. Um, and it was kind of cool because it was faster than existing BitTorrent algorithms. It was faster than building a distribution tree or a chain or things like that. It's also very um, uh, tolerant to, uh, to outliers and slow machines. Um, so this is what I say, and, and this application is the one that did one or two gigabytes of data. Uh, and so this, this is what you get with the Hadoop distributed cache. But I think this is a good example of like fitting in something in the model that's interesting from a research point of view and is also very easy to use with the existing model. Okay. So that's, uh, that's broadcast. Um, let me talk uh, uh, next about um, accumulate. Oh, question about this? Yeah. This one, um, yeah. Yeah, no, no, what it is, in both of them, each machine is reading the file only once, but in the first case, we put it in HDFS and we replicated. We tried replicating at three ways or 10 ways, uh, whatever, Th there's a bit of a trade-off there. And in the second case, uh, one node has it at first, and then it starts at like a BitTorrent swarm. So everyone else talks to it, receives little blocks of the file, and then the machines start talking to each other as well um, and passing it among themselves. Ah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's faster, yeah, because the protocol is different and because we utilize all the links. Because with HDFS, like, there's a bottleneck either in the initial replication of like how many nodes am I gonna send it to, or after that, say you sent it to three nodes, the, those three nodes are the bottleneck. And here you quickly use every hand's bandwidth, that's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the computation times are the same. The, sorry, th this is meant to show, so this is when the CPU time, and this is the networking time, and when you add them together, that's the time the whole program took. Um, so, so this, no, this is only in Spark. This is all in Spark, yeah.
so, so here it's a little bit more general point. So when you have such an application, a parallel application, usually you think that you are going to scale it up and reduce the response time or the, or the computation time, well, the, the application overall response time, by increasing the level of parallelism. And this will work, so even if you assume that this uh, application is uh, embarrassingly parallel, <coughs> um, soon you are going to hit the communication bottleneck. Because usually as you increase the number of nodes or the number of tasks, the, the, the communication doesn't decrease. So each task will become smaller, but you still transfer the same amount of uh, data. When you do a shuffle, for example, or, or this kind of broker. So optimizing the communication soon becomes very important. And like this on the left hand side, that's why, you know, the co as you increase the number of machines, the computation decreases like you'd expect, right? But the communication, the percentage, it's actually becoming even, even worse. Yeah. Okay, oh, another question. Did, did these queries spill over to this? They didn't. So this was a, a thing that was actually almost entirely CPU bound. The only uh, issue was you had to like um, you had to send this matrix to all the machines at the beginning of each uh, iteration. So it was all the data fit very nicely in memory. It was only you had they you have to give them the current matrix. They each work on a little piece of it and they give you back the result and then you put all those together and broadcast them again. Um, I think, yeah, this could spill over to disk, uh, although in, in this experiment it didn't, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool, yeah. Okay, so this, you know, this is broadcast, so it's pretty simple to use, but it's, it's kind of a, a good chance to, to optimize and, and design an interesting, like, distributed protocol to do this. Um, the next thing, accumulators, is, is also very simple, um, but it, it also shows another way to generalize the model. Um, so. The issue we're solving here with accumulators is, um, is, is often when you write an application, you want to aggregate multiple values at the same time. And uh, if you use you know, the reduced functions in Spark or something like that, you can do it, um, but it can get a little unwieldy because you have to send back ideally all of those together in one sort of structure. So accumulators generalize a concept called counters in MapReduce um, that, that lets you just have you know, little counters throughout the program that you increment wherever you are. Uh, but they do it in a way with nice syntactic sugar that uh, you know, looks a lot like a local program in Scala. Okay. So here's how to use them in a nutshell. So in this uh, example, we, we want to do a filter on a data set and we want to keep only the stuff matching the filter. But we also, um, as we're doing the filter, we want to count the number of bad records and skip them. And maybe we want to count the total number of bytes that we skipped as well. So accumulators are this variable which is the, you, you create on the master and you can add to it inside a task. And the, up, the things you add to it will be propagated back to the master. But you can't do anything else to it in the task. In particular, you can't read it because the tasks are not kept in sync with each other. So it's really just syntactic sugar for um, or reduce. But it's done in this way where any task can use any accumulator and the values will make it um, all the way back. Um, and you know, I hope this this example you know is fairly self-explanatory. Um, you you make the accumulator. You use plus equals. You add stuff according to its type. So you can make accumulators of type int or double or other types. Um, and to access the value back on the master, you can do dot value. Yeah. Question. Oh, at the end, yeah, you would need to actually call an action on records here. That's a good point because otherwise the filter will be lazy and there'll be nothing. Uh, yes. <laughs> Or you wouldn't save or something like that, yeah. Okay, so that's, you know, that's, that's pretty simple. Um, just wanted to, to mention that this exists, you can use it. And these things are type safe, so this is an accumulator of int, you can't add like doubles into it. This is an accumulator of doubles, you know, you can't add strings, stuff like that. Okay, um, the rules, um, yeah. Um, so how does this work in the context of uh, controlled quality and controlled cost. So if I want to accumulate, but only allow a certain cost for computation, I'm uh, willing to accept degraded quality of accumulation. Oh, 
I, I'm not sure I got it. So you're saying you want to accumulate only if it's not too expensive to send the updates back, or? Um, not really. What I'm saying is I want an approximation where I might not end up processing all of the data oh, okay. if I exceed my computation time. Right, yeah. So this actually, yeah, so to get approximate results, that's completely different. This is not meant to do that. This will always uh, accumulate and do everything. We are actually working on some stuff with approximate results, but I don't think I have time to go into it. So we can talk after if you want. Um, you can actually find them in the dev branch, though, if you try. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, so we'll see, use this, I mentioned you know, before, you create them with Spark context that accumulator, um, you add with plus equals, which is you know, syntactic sugar for like this method we implemented, it's an overloaded operator. Um, and the scheduler actually takes care that if it runs a task multiple times, you only count the effect once. Um, so that's something we can do because in the scheduler we know when we run each task. And you can only access the value on the master. Um, one last thing you can do and maybe you'll find useful is defining custom accumulators. So if you have your own data type like a vector or whatever, some, some complex number, whatever things you're working with in your program, you can create your own accumulator and you just need to create this object that extends accumulator param and that tells the system how to work with your data type. So you tell it a, a method that gets a zero for your data type, um, which is what we'll initialize the thing to on each machine and you give it a method called add in place that merges the values. So just as a quick example, if we have a vector class and in it it contains a double array, um, you can create, this is how you create an accumulator param. You have to make an implicit object. I'm not gonna really explain what implicit means here, um, but you, you make this thing. Um, and in it, um, you, you have, you know, first given a vector, what's the zero? element for that type of vector. So we, we make another vector of the same size, but with all zeros. And second, how do I add two of them? And it's called add in place because as an optimization, you can update, modify the first one and return it. So you don't have to allocate a new vector in here. Uh, yeah, question. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, how does the communication happen? So um, in a nutshell, so there's two types of communication. First is sending out the task and getting back the task result. This is just done over the network with the, the master opening a socket to, to the worker node and getting that back. So that's how these things get shipped. And all these objects are serialized with, you know, Java serialization or whatever your serialization library is. The second thing is the shuffle. So for the shuffle, like when I was showing the join that, that happens um, uh, with a distributed reduce, there we actually spill stuff out to files because that's how we deal with like what if the amount of data you shuffle exceeds memory. Um, so yeah. Uh, yes, exactly, yes, yes. Um, where is the add in place um, function evaluated? The, where is the add in place evaluated? It's evaluated on the machines whenever you do plus equals. So this plus equals here is a, um, is, is not just calling the plus equals of the type. It's gonna call this add in place. It's an overloaded operator. On the workers. Yeah, on the workers. And each thread gets its own copy of the accumulator, yeah. Yeah. So why, why do you use terminology like add? It seems to me this will work for any associative operation, multiply, min, binary. Yeah, it's a good, add. yeah. We should, we should probably call it something else. I think if I, if I went out and called this a group or something, people would be, <laughs> would be upset, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's a good point though, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay, and basically, you know, once you define this, you can magically use accumulator or vector. Okay, um, and uh, just to see another common thing, you know, the main place where I've seen people use this is to compute stuff like averages. So doing an average with a single reduce function is kind of annoying. You have to send back to both the, the sum and the count at the same time, and with an accumulator, it's pretty easy. Um, and here I'm using this for each, which is an action we haven't seen before, I think, but basically it just runs something on the nodes for the side effect, which in this case is updating an accumulator. So that's all it's doing. Okay. 
So that's so those are those are the shared variables, and there's actually you know other things you can do. Uh, there are some folks um, at Princeton, for example, working on using this to do like branch and bound and having other semantics for shared variables. But it gives you a sense of what you can um, have in, in Spark right now. Um, the second thing I want to talk about then is uh, is data partitioning. Um, and this is also important for the same reason that broadcast was because uh, it really affects network usage. So um, if you, again, if you remember from Jan Stock, network bandwidth is easily 100 times as expensive as memory bandwidth, so it's a thing you have to be careful with. Um, and in Spark, we try pretty hard to do locality aware scheduling um, for data that's in memory and on disk. But uh, when you have to do a shuffle, like the join we showed before, uh, there's not much scheduling you can do. If the data starts out on different nodes and has to be brought together, it will have to, uh, to go over the network. So you, controlling the partitioning of RDDs is another um, a tool that can help minimize data movement. So to explain this, I'm going to go back to uh, the PageRank uh, application we saw yesterday. Um, and if you remember uh, PageRank, we basically had these iterations and we had these two data sets, uh, the links, uh, the neighbors of each page and uh, the rank of the current page. And we had to join them each time so that we can split each page's um, uh, current rank across the links. So there's the code at the bottom. Basically, you know, we, we take the links and ranks, which are these key value pairs, we join them, and now for each URL, we have the links and the rank, and we produce these, uh, these contributions. And after that, we have to group the contributions and uh, do this map to actually like, implement the algorithm. Okay, so let's look at how this executes in the way it was written uh, yesterday. Um, so this uh, thing on the left here shows the RDDs themselves. Each RDD is a, um, is a box. And basically what we have is links, we probably created it by taking an input file and doing a map function to get these URL neighbor pairs. Ranks, um, we, we might have just created it from scratch or we might have done another map on that, doesn't really matter. And what we're doing is each time we do a join on them, um, that brings them together to the same node. Um, and then we do a reduce by key and we get the new ranks. Um, then we do another join, another reduce by key and so on. So each time we're doing a join, we're going to have the same story we had before, where the links and ranks are spread out across the nodes in per perhaps an arbitrary way, and we have to hash, um, for each URL, we have to hash them to the same machine. Um, and that, that's uh, expensive. So what, what can we do in this case? Um, one observation we can leverage here is that uh, each time we're doing a join, we're always joining against links. So the same data set will get hashed uh, and sent over the network over and over again. Um, so what we could do instead is partition the data set across the machines initially so that it's hash partitioned and then not send it over the network. Instead, just send the ranks to the machine that has the links for that particular hash code. So um, I'll, I'll show what that looks like in a second. But um, here's how you could implement it. Um, so so you can take when you build your ranks data set, you, you did a map, you can use this other operation partition by where you pass in a hash partitioner or you can pass in another type of partitioner object that sends these to, a, 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 to that just distributes these across the machines. And then the code below it is exactly the same. Um, but what will happen now is that the join knows that um, uh, the, this, this data set is hash partitioned and um, it, will, um, uh, it will process, uh, you know, it will not shuffle it again. Okay. Um, so here's what it looks like. So at the top we have links. We take the input file, we map, and then we partition. So this picture is gonna show, uh, like the, some of the pictures we saw yesterday, is gonna show RDDs, which are these, um, uh, these tall boxes, and partitions inside the RDD, which are going to be the shaded boxes. And when we do the partition by, this shows it, it got sent over the network. The map didn't need to go over the network. You could have done it locally on each machine. So when we start with ranks and links, when we do the join, um, we, since, since we already hash together um, the, the links, we don't need to reshuffle that across the network. We can just keep them as is. Um, and so this will, will, will save some cost here. Um, what will happen next is, um, next we're going to do the flat map and reduce on uh, the ranks. Uh, we're going to produce some new ranks. And, uh, here we have to shuffle because each machine might have sent contributions to you know, any 
page on any other machine. Um, and then when we do the join again, um, in this join, actually neither the hanks nor the links need to be shuffled because when we produce the hanks one over here, we, um, we did it through a reduced by key. So we know that the result is hash partitioned already. Um, so so this, this is kind of how it works. And um, you can just go on from there um, and you know, it, it goes for multiple steps. Uh, any questions about this so far? Yeah, okay. So yeah, so, so that's what, uh, what happens. So just the way it works internally is that each RDD has optionally a, a partition or object that says how the keys are mapped to machines. And if you do a shuffle operation on an RDD that has a partitioner, like um, uh, join for, for, um, or, or reduced by key, then we'll respect that partitioner and we won't send the data around. Um, if you do an operation on two RDDs and one of them has a partitioner and one of them doesn't, we respect the one that does. And you know, if they both have one and it's not the same, then we have to send stuff around. Um, but that's kind of how it works. And of course, each, each time we do a shuffle, we know that the result is partitioned. And so we mark it as having a hash partition. Uh, so just to show some examples in, in code, uh, here's one thing you might write. So say you have you know, pages join visits and then you do a reduce by key. So in this case, the join produces a hash partition data set. So the reduce can happen locally. Like for example, all the visits to you know, home.html might be on this machine and we can just group them locally. Um, that's, that's pretty simple. Um, so here the output of joins already partitioned. Um, if we did uh, something else, like say we did a join and then we did a map um, and then we did a reduce by key. Uh, now we have a problem because in map, there's an arbitrary function in there. So the function might change the key of each element. So we don't know anymore whether the output of map is still hash partition. And in this case, we, we have to shuffle when we do the reduce because we've lost this knowledge. Um, and if you use um, uh, the map values operation, which we saw before, map values actually only updates the value. It keeps the key the same. And Spark knows that this will keep the partitioning the same. So in this case, um, the reduced by key still doesn't require a shuffle. Um, so map values you know, is the operation for that. So all the operations in Spark that do um, shuffles know about partitioners and mark the partitioner on the output. And it's a very, um, like it's, it's a, a thing that's, that the scheduler will, will carry through across any operations you kind of compose. Okay. Um, how much does it actually matter? So here's uh, the page rank we showed before. Yesterday I showed the results for just Hadoop and basic Spark. And you know, it was going uh, like two and a half times faster, which is okay. But if you turn on controlled partitioning, um, which is just that line I added at the top with partition by, you gain another factor of three in performance. Um, and why does this happen? Well, as I mentioned, network is, is the main cost. And in particular, in, in page rank, actually the links RDD is much bigger in terms of bytes than the ranks. Uh, if you think about it for links, each page might have hundreds of links. So you have like a list of 100 things. For ranks, you only have one number. Yeah. Oh yeah, so if you're working locally, I think the benefit is much smaller. Uh, there's still something I think because when we run locally, we'll like, we'll, we still do the shuffle over the network just locally simply because we wanna go through the same code path, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, other question? Is there, a, is there a possibility that you know, this could be optimized uh, is there a possibility that this could be optimized automatically in future? And oh yeah, to optimize automatically. It would be nice to do it. I think in Shark in particular, we're gonna do it. In Spark, the philosophy has been to keep the, the system sort of controllable and then let people build layers on top if they wanna do automatic optimization. Uh, but uh, you know, some people have actually started doing that. So we might provide a layer on top that does it or we might even push it down, yeah. I guess that was a, a piece of my follow-up. So uh, to which of these operations is, is Shark already doing? Like I was assuming that mm. if you join two tables in Shark and the default implementation is a hash join, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it would effectively be doing hash partitioning of the data sets underneath the covers mm -hmm. uh, already. Yeah, so, so, so Shark is doing, I think Shark is, um, 
is doing the kind of operations you'd write by hand. So it, in the case like you mentioned, if you did a hash join, it knows that the result is hash partition. And then if you do a reduce or an aggregate after, it will automatically get this benefit. Um, it doesn't do the map side join yet, although uh, we're working on adding that in there too. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so just a couple um, more things on this. So first, if you want to tell is my RDD actually partitioned properly, you know, we try to make it fairly, um, make it do the right thing in most cases. But you can also ask an RDD what its partitioner is. So here I just made some RDDs in the Scala shell. And if you ask for partitioner, you get this option. Option is a, is a collection that has like either zero or one elements in it. It's, you know, a better way than returning null. Um, and this one has no partitioner. This has a partitioner. Some means it, it, a partitioner exists. Um, and you can work with this. Um, I should also say about this, that like if you actually try it now, um, the, the master branch doesn't propagate partitioners in all the operations yet. But if you try the dev branch, I think we've gotten all of them there. So that's the one that will actually work um, most closely to what I've shown. Although all the examples, I think, work in master too. Um, and finally, you can also customize partitioning. So this is, um, this is actually quite important as, as the next step, uh, especially if you're dealing with social data or web pages or stuff like that. Um, it basically, if you have domain-specific knowledge, you can do better than just hashing stuff around. Um, for example, if you're doing page rank, you know that a page um, tends to have links to other pages in the same domain. And you might want to keep all of those on the same machine so you don't have to send, them a, send these um, contributions across the network. Um, so you can plug in a, a partitioner in Spark to do that. Um, you can just extend the partitioner interface and you have to in implement uh, just a few operations in there. Um, and you know, people have done this to optimize these kinds of applications and it can make a significant impact, like a factor of two or three, it, it can make even more than that. Um, so just in a nutshell, what you implement is you have to say how many partitions you're creating. You have a method to get the partition for a key. And you also have to have an equals method. It's not super obvious, but we need to know when we get two RDDs with a partitioner whether those two are compatible or not. So you should implement that. So that's kind of what it is. Okay. Um, so final thing I want to talk about then is extending Spark. I don't have a ton on this, but uh, just wanted to mention some of the things you can do. Um, so Spark provides several places where you can extend stuff, and these include just configuring some classes or actually adding new types of RDDs and things like that. Um, and the, as I mentioned at the beginning, our goal was to keep the system small. And uh, Spark is actually, um, in total, it, it's about 20,000 lines of code. And I think that's uh, at least a factor of 10 smaller than Hadoop, for example. Last time I looked, Hadoop was two or 300,000 lines. So, and, and a lot of these things I'm gonna show are uh, actually only a small fraction of what the code is. Um, so we really want to encourage people to, to do this, especially more research-oriented people. Um, so there's a few things. First of all, you can extend RDD. You can make your own subclass to add new types of input sources or new transformations. And users have actually done that uh, in a bunch of places. Um, you can customize caching. So if you have an idea of how to better replace stuff when, when you run out of space, you can do that. You can also customize object serialization. This actually really affects the network bandwidth as well uh, because, and, and um, it, it can also affect in memory uh, usage. So some of the things users have done are implement new transformations. Um, some of these are now in the Spark code base. So stuff like sampling and new types of joins are there. They've implemented new input sources. For example, the Carrot project you'll hear about later implemented DynamoDB. Um, and they also did custom serialization. Um, since I don't have a ton of time, uh, and I'm just gonna talk very briefly about serialization because it's one of the things that can actually really improve performance, but it's not really obvious at first. So why look at serialization? Um, the first place stuff gets serialized is when it gets sent over the network. And I don't have to say that, you know, if you save a factor of two there, maybe your application will go twice as fast. So it, it affects network usage. Um, the other way people use it is to improve memory efficiency. So it turns out if you store data as Java objects, depending on your data structure, there can be a high overhead over the hot types. 
just as an example, say you store a linked list of integers. Well, an int in Java is four bytes, but a linked list has an object for each um, int, and that object has an object header and stuff that's usually about 16 bytes, and it has a pointer to the next object that's about eight bytes. So we're talking a factor of five or, or more overhead in representing this data. Uh, in Spark, you can store the data serialized if, if you prefer, if you have this kind of data structure, uh, using serializing cache, and there you care about how fast serialization is. Um, and by default, we use Java serialization, and we chose that because it just works transparently with most data types and because most users know how to use it. But with, with any large amount of data, it's quite slow. So you, this is one of the things you can optimize to, to gain a pretty significant benefit. And the reason it's slow is because it's designed to be forward compatible since like Java 1.0. So it's, it's not you know, that they did something wrong. Um, so just to give you a sense, there's this online you know, Java serializer benchmark. Uh, this is the time to serialize some objects. And I, I don't think you can easily see the numbers, but at the bottom we have Java serialization, which took 97,000 um, uh, milliseconds, I guess, uh, to serialize this object. At the top, we have um, other libraries. So for example, um, this is if you serialize them by hand, you can do it in only 5,000 um, uh, milliseconds. And there's a, for example, Cryo is a serialization library that takes about 7,000. So there's a huge difference. This is, a, this is basically a log scale down here. Um, uh, this is the time. Um, if you look at space, there's also a difference in space. So these objects with Java, they take about 900 bytes. Um, with most of the smaller libraries like Cryo, they take 200 bytes. So that's again, it saves quite a bit of time. So if you want to implement your own um, serialization, you can extend the Spark that serializer interface, and it's a pretty simple interface that you can do. But the other thing I want to mention is there is one library out there that we include in Spark called Cryo that's actually quite good. And the reason I like Cryo is it's one of the fastest in the benchmark, but it's also one that has minimal boilerplate. You don't need to like define your objects in advance, say in an AVO schema or protocol buffer or stuff like that, which can get quite annoying. Um, and uh, just a note, we use version one of Cryo now. There's a version two out that we'll probably switch to uh, eventually. Um, and to use this, uh, it's actually not too bad to use. The only um, uh, tricky thing is you have to register all the classes you're gonna serialize in advance. And the way you do that is by creating an object that extends this Cryo registrator and that actually registers them. This is how you pass in a class to register. Um, and then you set some system properties. You tell it to use the cryo serializer. You tell it to use your registrator. And if you want the serialized cache, you can tell it to use the serializing cache as well. Um, and you have to do this before creating a Spark context so that it can actually read the properties. But that's kind of what you have to do. There are examples in the code of doing this. Um, and we've seen this make a significant difference. Like we've seen factor of four in space, factor of 10 in uh, time to, to do a program um, using cryo. Um, and so this is a thing you should profile and see, in my guess, in, in most cases when something is slow, it's actually because of this. Uh, and we definitely plan on working on it further as well. Yeah. So if you want to use like the kind of tools of Apache app or something like uh -huh. that, Yeah, you would extend serializer to add it, yeah. For Avro. For Avro, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So the last thing I want to end up with is to reiterate this point about we're trying to build an extensible platform. Um, so if you look at the code base of Spark, it's, it's actually quite small, and these features I show, like accumulators and broadcasts, don't add a ton to it either. Um, so I just showed some of the key components here. Uh, in the core, it's about 14,000 lines. And some of the stuff that you'd think is a lot, like RDD operations, we have these 20 or 30 functional transformations, is actually uh, only about 10% of the code. Um, stuff like the job scheduler or the networking, if you want to change that, it's a couple thousand lines. Accumulators are very little. Actually, a lot of the code is in broadcast because we implemented many algorithms. But in practice, we're, we're going to actually delete some of the ones that are less useful, and that might get smaller. Um, so this is just to give you a sense, and we encourage people to plug in new runtimes and new uh, data sources, stuff like that.
so in conclusion, I hope that this has given you both a, a slightly more uh, nuanced view of what you can do inside Spark and a sense of what you can do to improve application performance. Um, we've designed these features to deal with problems we saw, um, and one of the, the core themes has been that the bottleneck is basically either the network or the CPU once you have the data and memory. So these are the things that we're optimizing. Uh, and definitely let us know if you want to, uh, to add other extensions to the system. Okay, thanks. Time for two, two questions. Okay, thanks so much for that. Great ideas for optimizing. So one, one question though, some of them, they're very different things you can do, right? If, if mm -hmm. the serialization is the problem or the shuffle is the problem or whatever, are there good diagnostics for sort of, you know, an, an easy hmm. way of yeah, are there good diagnostics? Yeah, so there are some things you can do now. Uh, we actually want to work on automated tools as well. But right now, if you want to see um, uh, the memory usage of the cache that's printed in the logs, so that's one thing. If you want to see the amount of data shuffled, you can actually find the files. I don't know if we print the size anywhere, but there's a folder where you can find the files for each shuffle, so you can correlate those back. And for CPU, um, you can use sort of a standard Java profiler to do that. You can just attach it to the running process. We're, we want to build, uh, we have a project to build a debugger for Spark that will do more of this stuff, but it's not quite ready yet. Yeah. Um, um, I think it's very hard for MapReduce, the Hadoop framework, to incorporate column store because of the locality issue. Mm. And I wonder if Shark can uh, have some column store support. Yeah, column oriented storage. Yeah, so that's that's actually one of these things that I I would like to see happen with the RDD layout. So I talked about uh, partitioning. It would be cool to control the storage too. And in Shark, we tried to do a little bit of it already, but that's one of the things we will probably be working on in the future. Yeah. All right. Thanks again, Matei. Cool.